My name is Bella Ben, and I'll be presenting um, some numbers on EAP6 session clustering performance. Um, I know it's a little hard to um, show up after the party on a, you know, after the Chavos party, and uh, so I'm happy that at least a few people found this room. Okay, I have to uh, announce that the summit co uh, code, whatever this is, is 1474. 1474. So as I said, my name is Bella Ben, and uh, I'm the lead of uh, J Groups, which is that little, tiny little project doing the clustering um, uh, transport, more or less, reliable transport. And um, I also wrote JBoss Cache, the first couple of versions. And JBoss Cache, for those of you who don't know, is the predecessor to InfiniSpan, which is now used for JBoss um, clustering. OK, um, so what's this talk about? This is really about a simple and stupid web application which writes to and reads from a, cluster, from a session. And we're running it on EAP6. I benched it on a cluster size ranging from two nodes to 16. And I'm going to talk about performance. I'm going to talk about the before, which is basically a stock uh, EAP6. Um, and deployed the web app into this stock instance and got some performance numbers. And then um, I'm going to talk a little bit about tuning, how this can be tuned. And then we're going to compare the performance before and after. Along the way, these are side points. You're going to learn how to configure an EAP6 cluster and get some tuning advice and best practices on how to use um, and configure EAP6 uh, clustering. When I talk about EAP6, I started out using JBoss 7 first, the community project, and then the first versions of EAP. So EAP6 is more or less JBoss 7. Okay? And by the way, if you have questions, just interrupt me. Let's try to make this a little interactive. Unfortunately, I don't have a demo. It's hard, kind of hard to show a demo on performance. But um, the slides, I think the numbers should, should, uh, should be good enough, because I can already promise you some very good numbers for EAP6 clustering performance. OK, I have one slide on the architecture of an EAP cluster. Here, we see two instances. And the major subsystems that make up clustering. Um, at the top, we have the JBoss code, EA, EAP6 code, which basically implements session clustering. So this code kicks in when you add the distributable tag to your web application. What does it do? In essence, it takes a session and places it into InfiniSpan, which is the second subsystem here. And InfiniSpan then uses JGroups, this is my baby down here, uh, to replicate or distribute the sessions across a cluster of EAP6 instances. So actually, this is very simple stuff, where one subsystem stands on top of another. And these two instances here form a cluster. So by the way, if you have questions regarding to J-Groups, um, I'm available all day long. I'm, I'm, my flight leaves at 10, so you can ask me any kind of questions. You can also ask me questions about InfiniSpan. I'm also, I also used to be the lead of this at one point, a long time ago. So, um, OK. So we have two modes in JBoss clustering. They're called replicated mode and distributed mode. Replication basically takes your data and copies it to all the nodes in the cluster. Distribution takes your data and copies it to n backup nodes. And so let's talk about the differences between the, the pros and cons of these two advantages, the next couple of slides, and um, start with replication. So what is replication? It's very simple. Every data you store in one of the nodes is going to be copied over to all of the nodes of an EAP6 cluster. Any modification you make will also be updated, will also be sent to all the nodes in the cluster. Every node has a local cache. And because all the writes go to all the nodes, everybody has exactly the same state. By state, I mean, for example, the set of sessions that all the users have in a given node. The good thing about this is that reads are always local, because everybody has the same state. You don't need to go retrieve your data from a remote uh, node. You just go local. You do a local read. 
when a new node joins, you start up a new EAP6 instance. What it has to do in order to get the same state is something called state transfer. So basically, the new node starts up, gets the state from the oldest member, the so-called coordinator, copies it into its own local cache, and from then on, it has exactly the same state as everybody else, and therefore, clients can go to their new nodes and it would be operational. However, so okay, the good thing about replication is it's very simple. It's very simple and there is no, uh, no setup involved. However, the bad thing is scalability is limited um, by the cluster size and the average size of your data. Let's say you have 10 nodes, 10 EAP instances, EAP uh, 6 instances. Every node has about 100 megabytes of state. So basically, every node needs to be a backup for everybody else. So we have 10 times 100 megabytes that we need to um, have in our, in our heap, in our local cache. So every node basically has one gigabyte uh, of data. This may or may not be a problem. For example, if you have, have 100 nodes, but every node only has 10 or 10,000 bytes of state, then this wouldn't be a problem. Or if you have a, a small cluster and every uh, node has a little bit more state, then it wouldn't be a problem either. But your heap size here has to be uh, greater than the product of the cluster size and the average data size. How does it look like? This is actually also the setup of the client, uh, of the, of the uh, perf test. So we have mod cluster here. Mod cluster is a very cool, in my opinion, very cool um, tool to actually um, distribute load. It's an Apache module to various JBoss EAP backend instances. It's very dynamic. The instances just register with mod cluster. They register not only themselves, also the web apps that they serve. And there's also a feature that allows these guys to send load information back to mod cluster so that the clients can actually or more cluster can actually dispatch client requests to the least loaded node. So that's very cool technology. So more cluster then forwards um, the write to one of those nodes, let's say uh, to node number three. And this guy, um, this, uh, this triggers replication whereby the change is sent to node two and node one. So all the changes are replicated everywhere. Now, when a client comes in, and does a read, for example, a get attribute of a session, it's directed to the, let's say, to the same node, node number three, if we have uh, sticky sessions, and then we're just reading that value and returning it to more cluster. By the way, this protocol here is either HJP or HTTP, depending on how you set it up, and more cluster would then send the HTTP response back to the client. So this is very simple. The replication mode is default in InfiniSpan. In, I, I should say in EAP6, yes. Now, let's talk about the second mode, distribution. Now, instead of storing the node everywhere, we just store it on n nodes. For the purpose of this um, talk, I'm gonna say n is two for the rest of this talk, okay? So n is always two. So we store every key and value pair on exactly two nodes. Now. There is something called a consistent hash to, um, given a key that's called, let's say, ID, it needs to find the two servers, servers which host ID. How do we do that? Um, we, let's say the cluster consists of ABC, DEF, six instances. So first, we take the hash of ID, which might be eight for the purposes of this example, and then we do a mod function, this would be our consistent hash function, and we come up with two. Two is basically B. Three would be assuming that we started index uh, one. <laughs> uh, so basically what that means is the consistent hash tells us that the server at index two and the server at index three will be the ones who host ID. So in this case, it's B and C who host ID. And by the way, this is a very stupid consistent hash function. Um, we have very uh, intelligent consistent hash functions in InfiniSpan, murmur hash, everything that has a much better distribution than this. A good consistent hash function on a view change 
only needs to rebalance one nth of the keys where n is the number of servers. So if you have a good, good consistent hash function and 10 servers and one server joins or leaves, you have to only rehash uh, one, you know, tenth of your keys in the worst case. Yes, yes. So what you can do is this hash function, consistent hash function is pluggable. It's an implementation of an interface and we've got five, six um, consistent hash functions. You can plug in your own hash function. For this is not the one that we use. Now this is a stupid one. The one that you use is called murmur hash, much, much more advanced, or murmur hash two actually. This is just for the example. So what we end up with, anyone who knows the key knows that that key is going to be allocated on B and C. Now let's take a look at what happens when we need to do a rebalancing. Let's say B crashes, this guy crashes or leaves. The new view is now A, C, D, E, F. Now the 8 mod 5 is 3. So now it's D and E that are going to host that key which means B now knows that um, B, or sorry, C, the backup owner, now knows it needs to copy ID over to D, over to E, and remove it from its own local cache. Okay, so the point of this is just to show you that rebalancing happens when you add new nodes or when you remove nodes. And the other point I'm trying to make here is that this has a cost associated. So for example, keys need to be locked while a rebalancing is in progress. That's the downside. Compared to replication, it's a little bit more complex. Things need to happen when you need a rebalancing. But for example, what you could do is you could turn rebalancing off if you add 10 servers and only enable rebalancing once you've added the 10 servers. So you don't need to do 10 rebalancings but only one for 10 servers at the end of adding the 10 servers. But the, the gist of this is knowing the key, we always find the right servers. So this is very powerful and it scales to a large number of uh, servers in the cluster. So compared to replication, the right only updates the N owners of a key. I'm gonna show you that in our system, we're only gonna have one unicast write, or basically a write generates a unicast message. A read asks the primary owner and possibly stores the results in an L1 cache. An L1 cache is a simple uh, cache which caches keys, if enabled, that are not local. So if I want to access ID and I'm on A, but B and C have ID, I go to B, ask B for ID, get the result value and put it into my own local cache. The problem here is that, we, that this requires invalidations on updates. If B or C change ID, we need to send a multicast invalidation message. So if your cluster is 1,000 nodes, we're gonna have to send that message to 1,000 nodes. That's the downside if you use L1. But the good thing is distribution uses less space than replication, and the cost of shipping a modification is constant. Regardless of the cluster size, you always have to make one update here. This is very good for large clusters. And in a separate, if you're interested in scalability in general, I'm not gonna talk about scalability, I'm gonna talk about why I'm not gonna talk about this in a second, is that um, the, um, the replication is a function, the cost of replication is a function of the cluster size, but distribution isn't. And so we have very good scalability numbers for large clusters. And I can talk about scalability numbers off, offline if you're interested in this. So how does it look like? We've got a write K2, a client does a write to a K2, so this means a set attribute to the, to the um, session. And let's say we're picking B and C. So what happens is we're updating K2 to value two in B, and then also in C. These are the two servers that I, that I mentioned before. A read of K5 happens to just map to B, and this is the same as with replication, we just return the value. So here, we, there's no change, it's the same thing. 
except if we hit a node and found out that K5 wasn't local. If it was over here, which it isn't, we would have to do another blocking RPC to read the data from here and go back here and return it and possibly put it in that L1 cache that I mentioned before. Now you see, compared to replication, we have like a sp looks like a sparse matrix. K1 is only hosted by A and B, K2 by B and C, K3 by C and D, K4 by A and B, and so on and so forth. So we have more of the heap that you give us available to store data in. This is the big difference to replication, where you kind of waste you know, the memory that's given to you. Okay, so how does JBoss use distribution for session clustering? What happens is that JBoss, the clustering code, always stores a session on the current node. How is this done? When mod cluster, and I'm just using this slide not for showing how a read works, but let's say a, mod, a client creates a new session. The session doesn't exist. It maps to, no, it picks node B. At this point, we have to create a key, put it into InfiniSpan that's local. So what we do is we ask InfiniSpan, Infini give, us, give us a J session ID that lo that's local, that maps to B, so we don't have to go remote here. This is actually pretty cool code because this means we always have the session in the node in which it is local. If this node crashes and we fail over, over, what the clustering code does here is it creates a new cookie, a new J session ID, and returns it to the client. So it basically changes the cookie. Okay, so that it is always local. That's the main point. That uh, that's done by the clustering code, the AS, the EAP clustering code, right? The good thing, the advantages here are that there are never any remote reads or writes to the primary data owner of a given key. Only, and, uh, and the writes are basically, one of the two writes is always local, and the, the, the write only goes out to the backup owner of a given key. There is also no need for an L1 cache, and that's already my first tuning tip. If you use distribution in EAP6, you don't need an L1 cache. Okay, now updates can be sent across the cluster in a blocking or a non-blocking fashion, and I have one slide that talks about this. So we call this sync. Sync is blocking versus async. Async is non-blocking. Okay, let's assume you come in, your servlet does a session set attribute. If you use if you configured the cache to be blocking, to be sync, then basically the caller blocks until the changes have been applied around across the entire cluster, either using replication or distribution. And we use confirmation. Uh, basically, we're sending back X to basically, uh, you know, return when we, we return when we've got all the X. Async, in contrast, ships the changes in the background. So basically, that's a fire and forget. You do a set attribute, you return immediately, the updates are sent across the cluster, you know, in the background. So this means async is naturally faster than sync. And uh, this is also the recommended, I think, REPL async, replica, asynchronous replication is the default. This is the recommendation. Use async re uh, replication. But to do that, you have to use sticky sessions. Because what can happen, is the following. Let's say you pick node A and you do a put, a write. Immediately after this, you do a get, and it happens to map to node B. If the update from A to B made it before your get, you're gonna see the latest write. If not, you're gonna see the stale value, the previous value. So if you can't use sticky sessions, you cannot use async replication or distribution. Then you have to switch to synchronous um, replication or distribution. Uh, remember, sync always involves a round trip, a network round trip, so that's costly. So there are four combinations, synchronous replication, syn asynchronous replication, synchronous distribution, and asynchronous distribution. And those are the four modes that I actually benchmarked in my test. 
All right. Um, the next part would be the configuration of the EAP6 cluster. Yes? Changes are gone. So this is fire and forget. Okay. Um, if you use sync replication, however, we involve um, transactions potentially. If you, if you haven't configured, that has a downside too, because there's two PC across the cluster. It's not two PC local, but across the cluster. Yes, sir. Um, the, I'll have a slide on this uh, where I show that we're actually, what we recommend is use an internal network, a fast network, um, to do the replication. And if you have client access, public, I mean, clients are going to come in through um, Apache or cluster, that should be a different network. I'll briefly talk about this when I have the slide, uh, three slides down or so. So what happens when you have a cluster split, let's say a switch crashes and form, and basically you have two subclusters. This will be a cluster of four. Now you have one cluster of two and another cluster of two, and then the partition heals. What JGroups basically does by default is it has a merge protocol, it's called merge, which basically merges these guys back together into one cluster of four. However, if you had uh, changes to, the, to K1 over here, and changes to K2 over here, there's a merge function that you need to supply to basically make sure that value two is the same over here and over here. Um, with InfiniSpan, the next version of InfiniSpan, we're gonna solve this automatically, if possible, using eventual consistency. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a version history for the changes to every key. And if there is a merge, we're gonna see if we can merge those histories in a non, in a, in a, if we can merge them. If that's possible, we automatically determine the value of, va of value two. If that's not possible, we basically give you a choice of the two keys and their version histories, and you, you as an application programmer need to define what the new value is. And there, this is already called uh, uh, merging. I mean, you can already do this now in a slightly different fashion. But if you're interested in details, I can, we can talk about this after the, after the session. Okay, now a few slides on the configuration of an EAP6 cluster. First of all, let's look at the configuration of mod cluster. This is actually a cut and paste from the distribution, the mod cluster distribution. So there's almost no changes, except here, I did change the port to 8000. And then, this is something you shouldn't do in production. This port can be accessed by all the hosts, any host. The same over here. This is the mod cluster manager. I don't know if, you've, if you're familiar with mod cluster. This is a simple and stupid web app that uh, shows you some stats about uh, the current cluster, allows you to do, uh, the, the current mod cluster setup, allows you to make some changes and stuff. Um, here, allow from all is something you would not, would not do in production. Um, but, I mean, this slide is almost not needed. The only change I made here is I changed virtual host to 8000, port 8000. Now, Mod cluster has the advantage that compared to mod JK, you don't need to list all the workers in a file, but instead all, every worker has to have a reference of uh, Apache, where Apache is running. So here we're saying in the mod cluster subsystem of EAP, we're saying my Apache uh, daemon is running on cluster nine at port 8000. This advertise here, this means that we have the ability from our cluster to, to periodically send out multicasts packet, basically saying, hey, I'm cluster nine and I'm running at port 8000. And then if advertise was true here, you wouldn't even have to implement this uh, or define this cluster list. 
because we would automatically find all the Apache daemons running in the network. Now, most of the time, people have, um, won't be able to send multicasts between Apache and the backend servers. So I usually just define a proxy list. This can be a comma-separated list, so you can add more than just one Apache daemon to this list. Next, we have the cache configuration. So basically, if you remember the three boxes, JBoss clustering code, InfiniSpan, and JGroups, this is the first box. This is the second box. This defines the InfiniSpan subsystem. This defines the, the cache into which my sessions are stored. So what do we have here? It's the InfiniSpan subsystem. We create a cache container named web. And we define four caches, two of them being replicated and two of them being distributed. So these guys use mode replication. These guys use mode distribution. REPL async is, as, it, as its name uh, suggests, is, is using asynchronous replication. This guy is using synchronous replication. Here we have asynchronous distribution and synchronous distribution. The number of owners is two. And here is the mode. Um, by default, if you don't specify the cache in your web application into which you'd like to be stored, we're going to use synchronous replication. We're going to use the cache that's defined down here, the second here. Now, remember the three boxes? This is box number two. Box number three is JGroups. And this is defining the transport. So here, we're saying we would like this to be replicated or distributed across a transport called UDP. And that's defined on the next slide. Here we have, um, this is, by the way, all in standalone HA.XML or in domain XML. It's exactly the same thing. Here we have two transports, one called UDP. This guy uses multicasting to, for cluster traffic. And this guy, TCP, uses TCP connections to send updates across the cluster. The difference being that with a cluster of 10, one update, you send one message. With IP multicasting, whereas you send the same message nine times with uh, TCP. So my, our, my recommendation is always use UDP if you can. But if you have a network administrator who disallows use of IP multicasting, of course, you have to resort to TCP then. Now, this is the last step to cluster your application. This is uh, nothing spe special. You add your distributable tag to the web XML. And then in your JBoss web.xml, you can pick the cache into which you should be stored. So what we're saying here is, we want to have a cache container called web and a cache called REPL async. And if we go back one slide, then this means we're going to pick this cache container. I'm going to pick REPL async. That's the replicated cache called REPL async. If you didn't do this, by default, you'd be using the synchronous replication cache. Yes. Or you can, here, for example, we're defining four caches. But if you want, for example, another cache container that's using TCP, then you could have a second cache container using TCP. And this cache container would then be using UDP. What about owners? Is it owners? Oh, OK. Owners, I talked about the number of owners of a given key, the number of times the key should be stored in the cluster. So this is two. Courses, you can change this. I think there's a special moniker, measure, uh, marker minus one, which means replicated to all the keys in the cluster, but I'm not sure about this. I have to check. Uh, by, oh, sorry. Oops. What happened? This is certainly not what I wanted. Um, Basically, this is already in the name. This is a replicated cache, and this is a di distributed cache. The, the XML element basically suggests which cache to use. OK, any questions so far? Yes. Yes. 
So basically, going back to this slide, um, there is this famous standalone ha.xml or domain on XML, which has, which has a lot of, of this information available. And um, um, this would also allow you to define interfaces on which, um, uh, which for example, the multicast interface to which, uh, the, sorry, the multicast address which J groups should join, or the NIC interfaces to which the node should bind. Uh, this can be overridden by system properties, and if you use domain management, for example, this would have to be def defined in a host. Um, .xml, you know, the master, what it's called, master, host, master, slave, whatever. So this is all defined in, in one of those two files. Well, uh, not in the sense that we've kind of extracted all the interface port bind address information into a separate section in standalone HA or domain XML. So this is, is different. With uh, five and, and six, you had to go and change sep different files. So uh, except for that, I mean, what has, uh, what has changed in terms of like, uh, kind of maintenance time was not used in the five. Yes. Is that something, I mean, apart from that, are there other changes? Um, I don't know if you guys remember JBoss 5. I hope you forget real soon, because this was <laughs> not the best implementation of uh, AS, and ditto for six. So what has changed was there was a mode called body replication. This doesn't exist anymore. It was replaced by distribution. In, I'm just talking about the clustering subsystem. Um, then, of course, JGroups was updated to a newer version. Uh, uh, we replaced JBoss Cache with InfiniSpan. This is going from a tree-based model to a ha hash map-based model. That's quite a big change. Uh, the clustering code was streamlined and was improved, so, um, yeah. But if you used body replication before, this is not supported anymore, switch to distribution. It's more or less a similar model. It's not exactly the same model, a similar model. Yeah, but I use like that version of uh, the Right, right. Uh, body replication at a high cost in a kind of rebalancing the data. This doesn't exist here anymore. And I show you some performance numbers from 2008. It's an unfair advantage, uh, unfair comparison, but you'll see that uh, we've gone, com performance has gone through the roof. Of course, it's, it's an unfair, you know, apples and oranges comparison. You know, I'm not, I'm, this is not absolute performance. Your mileage may vary. I just wanted to give you a simple web app that I think is, is basically representing a lot of the, the web apps out there and gave you some performance numbers on this. Okay, so this is the test environment. Um, the network, the lab I used didn't change much from 2008, except we had newer machines. I don't even know, I'm not the, I'm not the hardware freak, I don't even know what, what these mean here. But we had a one gigabit network, so not 10, it's one gigabit. We had JVM 1.6, and I did only use these options. Uh, thinking that the JVM would use, using ergonomics, it would actually tune itself to the best performance. So here, if you, add a few flags, you might actually get even better performance. Then I had eight physical boxes available for the test, and I used one node, I created one EAP instance per box, per physical box, and when I was benchmarking the 12 and the 16 instance uh, cluster, we basically ran two EAP instances on some or all of the boxes, which means they're sharing the bandwidth, the CPU, and so on and so forth, for example, if you have two instances on a one gigabit network card, the max performance per instance is only around 60, 62 megabytes instead of the 125 megabytes. So keep this in mind when you see the numbers. Yes, yes. And uh, it wasn't even the fastest cluster with a 10 gigabit uh, network. That's left to the Hornet Q guys. And I, I was told to leave my hands off that cluster. So numbers would have been much better. Yes. In my opinion, always use, if you use mock cluster, use domains. Partition your 
huge clusters into smaller clusters, not because uh, there's fail ripple effects caused by failures or so, but just because it's easier to upgrade the individual domains. I had a talk uh, a couple of years ago on JBoss World where I talked about using Apache, it, it, I think it was even MoJK at the time, and domains, or maybe more cluster and domains. That's my suggested approach. I know by now the highest number of nodes in a single fat, uh, flat cluster is 1,000 nodes. But this is not something I recommend. If you want to have a cluster of 1,000 nodes, create four clusters of 250 nodes each and segment them using a domain, a mod JK, a mod cluster domain. Well, I'm not supposed to say domain, I guess. Now it's a, what's it called, a load balance group. Okay, so coming back to the question that we had before, this is basically our setup. This is our inter internal network, and this is the network that we actually used for, for clustering traffic. So J groups would bind to a 10.1 address, and all of these instances would use this network to uh, replicate for replication of distribution traffic. Um, so we would create instances on JBoss 1 through 8, and mod cluster would run on JBoss 9, and then the perf test client would run on JBoss 10, but it would use a separate network, namely the 192.168, to talk to mod cluster. And the reason we're doing this, and this is your question from before, is basically to separate the client-facing traffic and the clustering traffic. Because if you have both uh, sorts of traffic on the same network, you will see a performance uh, degradation. The test driver is the same driver I used in 2008. We always used 400 clients, but a client in this respect is, is just a thread inside of this test driver. Um, so 400 clients is always constant. And we execute 100,000 requests, so every client uh, runs approximately 250 um, HTTP requests. 90% of the requests are reads, 10% are writes, and this kind of reflected my experience talking to customers uh, about you know, their web shops where 90% are reads, people are browsing books, and then 10% are writes, people are buying books and check out. Um, so each client basically does the following. Um, we have a session that, have, that has 10 attributes. Each attribute has a 1K byte buffer, so the total session is 10,000 bytes. While we have, uh, still have uh, you know, 100,000 or more, uh, more than zero requests, we basically read a random attribute or write a random attribute. There's only one access to the session, either read or write. 90% chance it's a read, 10% chance it's a, it's a write. Then we decrement this number, we go on until we still have um, requests left, and then we des destroy the session, stop the timer, and dump the, um, the numbers. Okay, so let's look at a baseline. Basically, I wanna know how fast is Apache before actually, so we're looking at the local web application that doesn't do any clustering, and then we're looking at the clustered web application and look at the difference between local and clustered. And I'm not interested here in scaling out because then I would have to have more than 400 clients to actually stress the system sufficiently, generate enough load to actually um, scale out. So here's the baseline. Um, this is the blue line over here, around 30, 31,000 requests per second. This is basically running the same test driver on htdocs slash index.html. This is only served by Apache. This doesn't even go into mod cluster and it doesn't even go into the backend JBoss servers. So this is really just communication between, between the clients into Apache and back. Uh, then the red line is the um, a JSP that is static. It just returns a, a blah, blah, blah block. And basically, um, this means we're going into Apache, into the mod cluster subsystem, into one of the backend JBoss servers, but we don't access a session. We basically just return um, a text of 1,000 bytes. And then finally, the yellow line here is almost the same thing, but here we're actually running the entire web application, but this time we re removed the distributed tag, so it's just local. We still write and read to and from the session, 
but we don't you know, replicate it. You can see all three lines, the scale here is pretty fine-grained. We, we see all three lines hover around 30,000, 31,000 requests per second. So once we go to the clustered version of this, we're not going to get faster than this. And we're not going to get faster even if we throw more nodes at it because the client driver, one client driver, is not enough to generate enough tra uh, more traffic. Yes. Actually, yeah, I don't know what, why this is the case. I uh, think this was just a hiccup where. Um, maybe here we had a slowdown here, a lot of accumulated requests, and then they were all executed at the same time. To be honest, I can't really explain this away, and I didn't want to change my data here. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is something I don't understand. But you know, it's not, it's not a big change here. It's uh, talking about uh, 1,000 requests more per, per this is for the entire cluster. Now let's look at UDP. So we're using a UDP transport and then compare those numbers to the TCP transport. This, these are the numbers for UDP. You can see the blue line is the same as before. This is for the local web application. And these numbers are for this mode equals distribution, and this is for replication. What we see first is obviously distribution is much faster than replication. And why is this the case? This is an unoptimized um, web app. I'm already going to tell you that every request that comes in, even the read requ requests, are going to replicate 10,000 bytes. Even the read requests. And I'm going to tell you why in a second. There's two things you can do to make this go away. Um, so you can see uh, with distribution, we hit more or less 25,000 requests per second for the synchronous distribution at around eight nodes. And we almost hit the maximum for asynchronous distribution at around eight nodes as well. Going further here, we are cl very, very close to 30,000. So distribution is very, very good, even with an unoptimized web application that generates 10,000 bytes of, rep of distribution traffic per request. Replication here is between 6,000, I'd say, and 7,000 requests per second. You can see that synchronous replication is slower and asynchronous replication is slightly faster. Why the discrepancy between the two? This is clearly caused by traffic. So here, every single request needs to be sending 10,000 bytes to every node. Every node needs to take the 10,000 bytes, unzeroize them, put them into their local cache. Whereas here, we just have for updates, we just have one unicast write. So here, we have basically a message that's sent to 16 nodes, whereas here, the updates, the number of updates is always constant. It's always one node that we update. Now, looking at TCP, you can see that the difference between the two is, first of all, this line here, distribution, gets faster sooner because we're using TCP here, and uh, TCP uh, with only two owners basically uh, is, is very fast. Yes? Yes, yes, I have to mention that this was using sticky sessions, because if you don't use sticky sessions with distribution, this line would be down here somewhere. Because remember, every time you do a get or a write, it, the chances of it being local is basically one nth. So you would see a lot of synchronous gets, even if you use asynchronous distribution, if you didn't use sticky sessions. OK, the other thing that I'm seeing here is that TCP for replication is initially faster than UDP. But then, with increasing cluster size, TCP's performance goes down. If I flip between UDP uh, UDP, you see it's almost uh, linear, whereas with TCP performance goes down. The main reason here is if I want to do an update to 16 nodes, I have to send 15 messages whereas with, with, with TCP, whereas with UDP, I send one message. So one thing to take away from this is 
it's, pre it's preferable to use UDP if your cluster size becomes large or larger. But this is, again, a function of your data size and your cluster size. So the, I can't give you a hard and fast rule, but the larger your cluster gets, the more TCP traffic you will have, the less performance you will have. So then it's better to actually switch to UDP. OK. Um, now, I'm going to show you two steps to actually get performance of the, the yellow and the red line up to par with a local, rep, local web application. You have something in, uh, in, in JBoss, we have something in JBoss called replication granularity. This means what are you actually going to replicate? By default, we replicate the entire session. So attribute here is a change that I made. Session is the default. So in this case, if a request comes in, does a write, modifies one attribute out of 10, we're still going to serialize the entire session, generating about 10,000 bytes of, of uh, traffic. And remember, the more traffic we have from everyone at the same time, the less performance we'll get. So uh, this first change basically says that now we're only going to replicate 1K instead of 10K for each request. And the numbers are now uh, better. You can see the biggest change is uh, th this wasn't affected. This wasn't affected before. This is still the same performance. But you can see that REPL async, the performance has really gone up. Now we're sending 1K for still for every request, also for the read requests. But the performance is much better now. The, the red line, however, didn't move. And my, my, um, uh, my guess here is that's because we still need to wait for all the X. So latency is the dominating factor here. It's not the data that you have to replicate. But it's actually probably both. But here, remember, we have to wait for 15X uh, for synchronous replication to return. So this is probably the dominating factor here. And we're replicating a, um, a lot of traffic. OK. Now, the second um, step would be changing the replication trigger. The replication trigger is, um, is, a, is a configuration that determines when a session is dirty. By default, we have something called set a non-primitive get. This means whenever you call session set attribute, the session is marked as dirty. But, or when you do a get that returns a non-primitive type, so a byte buffer is a non-primitive type. So is a user-defined data type. So is a list, a collection, anything. Um, then we mark the session as dirty. And that's the reason that the reads were even triggering replication. Um, so the change here is to change this from set to non-primitive get to only set. Now, the 90% reads won't trigger replication at all. And by the way, these are default. Set the non-primitive get is the default, and the replication granularity is session by default. Why is that the case? Oftentimes, you have sessions that have a, a, a number of keys, and maybe a user-defined data type. And there, it's actually faster to serialize the entire session rather than keep um, you know, metadata per attribute and maintain that, and then serialize the metadata or the, the attribute individually. So it's much faster to actually serialize this in just one fell swoop. The other reason is probably we can send in the consultant uh, to you making two changes and you get much better performance. So this is also, uh, this is the business uh, explanation of the. Uh... OK, so this is basically uh, the effect of changing the replication trigger. Remember, before we replicated 10,000 bytes on every request, on 100% of, of the requests. Now, we're replicating 1K in 10% of all the cases. And what do we learn from this? The smaller your replication traffic, the more you can cut down on replication traffic, the faster it's going to be. Now, this is kind of somewhat the joke. This is the number from 2008. But we can't really compare it. The lab, I mean, the machines are faster. JBoss has improved from version 4 to version 7. That's probably the biggest change. And um, the, the driver is still the same, exactly the same, the test driver. But so we can't really compare this. I only have numbers for four, six, and eight nodes. But we can see, I mean, if you don't care, this is a good improvement. You see all the lines are basically 
uh, up here, which means this is almost the same as a local web application. So this is, this is actually pretty good. OK. So um, I have uh, three more slides, a few more tuning tips. When using InfiniSpan, I found out that asynchronous replication allows you to uh, enable something called replication queue. So what we do is we don't replicate immediately. We put everything into a queue, then replicate whenever uh, we've gotten 10,000 bytes or five milliseconds have elapsed. So this is, a, this is a, something you can enable. By default, it's off. I actually found that with this, I got only 18,000 requests. Without, I got 30,000 requests per second with uh, two nodes. So this might just be a data point that was off. I was not the only user of the lab. But um, I think replication queues, we need to still look into this a little closer, are counterproductive. Because J groups at the transport level bundles modifications anyway and does it much more efficiently than at this level. And then the problem is there's a memory increase if the generation rate, the, the, the rate of message sending, is faster than the rate of, of, uh, of, of flushing the queue. This queue, unfortunately, is unbounded. So if this condition persists for a extended period of time, you might, you, you're accumulating memory. So for now, we actually recommend turn it off. Then turn off the L1 cache for sessions. This became pretty obvious. This, the clustering code always uh, maps a session to the local cache, the local node. So we don't actually uh, need L1 cache, uh, caching because this generates invalidation traffic, and the invalidation traffic is completely uncalled for in this, in this scenario. Now, the network. Um, this is kind of a explanation why some of the replication numbers weren't so great, even for the unoptimized um, case. There's something called uh, flow control, Ethernet flow control. And J groups using multicasting runs much better if you have Ethernet flow control on. Because Ethernet flow control basically throttles the senders. You can't send faster on a given port then the receivers can actually consume those messages. This is, uh, this is a standard 802.2. If you turn it on, performance is going to get much better for the replicated case. Um, now, this was off in my lab. Then the other thing is going from 1 gigabit to 10 gigabit obviously makes a big difference, too, because not only are the 10G NICs, uh, uh, they can have um, higher uh, bandwidth. They are usually also faster in terms of latency. So uh, going from 1 gigabit to 10 gigabit network is certainly a big must if you want opt optimal performance. And uh, 10 gigabit switches are not that expensive these days. So are mixed. If the price have really come, come down. So this would be a big, um, but we're only talking about you know, a lot of traffic from a lot of nodes in a big cluster. Yes, Andy. With turning? No, um, I did not use jumbo frames. Jumbo frames uh, is basically the ability to, to increase the MTU. Basically, instead of sending 1.5 Ks, which is the maximum uh, size, uh, you can send up to 9 K, I believe, or 16, I think. I did enable it for a separate test uh, a couple of years ago and found the performance was not much bigger, to my, to my surprise. But um, if you have large, num large data, uh, I would definitely uh, recommend looking into enabling jumbo frames. But jumbo frames have to be enabled everywhere. All the machines have to have jumbo frames enabled. So does the switch. This is certainly uh, something that might help. I had a different experience, but it's certainly worth uh, looking into. OK, then uh, talking about Apache, more cluster side, there's something called Mac Session ID in HTTPD.conf that you can enable. This is more or less for debugging. It shows you in the mock cluster manager application the sessions that you've allocated. If you enable this, performance is going to degrade. It's going to be very, very bad. So don't use this in production. It's very useful to see all the sessions in, uh, in your dev system, but don't use it in production. Then um, a, big, uh, a big mistake I actually made was I installed HBD in uh, my home directory. That means it's in NFS. And uh, logging just killed performance, because logging means anything you write to access log 
is going to be an, a blocking RPC to the NFS server and back. And so once I actually eliminated NFS by putting uh, HDPD into temp or into opt, performance increased from like 17,000 to 31 requests, 31,000 requests per second for the local case. So this was actually a mistake on my, 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 uh, my end, but always remember NFS is very good for sharing configuration data, but it's not good for uh, writing a lot of stuff to disk, because every write is a, and every read, of course, is a, is a round trip, an RPC round trip for NFS. Then decrease the logging verbosity. I actually turned logging off for access log, uh, or at least curtail access, because access log for the performance tests at least can be huge. So log rotation is your friend. Uh, use log rotation to truncate the logs every now and then. Okay, one uh, slide uh, on the conclusion, and we're done. So there's no hard and fast rule to basically, you know, what to use, but I give you a few, you know, um, suggestions to say the least. Um, so attribute and set are the best in most cases, but please experiment with this. If you have a small number of attributes uh, in a session, and then and the attributes are relatively small, then uh, session might be better than than attribute. I would say set is a good recommendation. Maybe we should change that default because people know what they're doing. If you do a get on a user defined data type, get attribute, and then you modify it, you can just do another set attribute to actually insert it into cache and trigger replication. So I think that use case that's uh, covered by set and non-replicated, a non-primitive uh, get is kind of contrived. Then, um, okay, when should you use replication? When the cluster size is small and the data, or the data is small. So the product of the data size, the average data size and the cluster size should be much less than the allocated heap. Remember much less, because JBoss, of course, takes some memory as well, and then, you know, um, so basically this, should, this product should be smaller than the allocated heap. But the reads are fast, no rebalancing, so, and very simple to set up. However, use distribution when the data is big or the cluster is large. You would certainly not use replication in a cluster of 500 nodes or 100 nodes. There, I definitely recommend using distribution because the access cost, as I mentioned before, is constant. It's not the function of the cluster size. Then we recommend to use asynchronous replication or distribution, uh, but you have to have session stickiness to enable this. If you don't, then switch to synchronous um, replication. Okay, so basically to conclude, um, EAP session clustering is, is very fast. This is, this is basically my conclusion. You saw that I have a relatively simple and stupid web application, only consisting of 10 attributes, 400 clients which read or write to and from the session. And your web applications are certainly more involved. They have beans in them. They might have um, cluster queues and stuff like this. But this is just a data point that I wanted to give you, a ballpark figure, a feeling of what the performance of EAP6 clustering is. And uh, you saw that, and I, I guess you would agree with me that the, the numbers are very good. One thing that you need to be aware of, the less traffic you generate, the better your performance will be. But again, your mileage may vary. So try this out. Uh, uh, you know what the knobs are that you have to tune now. And uh, it's always best to run this in your own you know, staging environment to, to, get, yeah, to see what the performance is. I did not really want to get super good performance here. So I could have used JGroups 3.1 instead of JGroups 3.0. I could have changed some of the, de some of the, uh, some of the stuff in InfiniSpan, use some of the later versions, but I really wanted to give you numbers for EAP6, not EAP6.1, for example. But you saw the numbers, and I think you would agree, the numbers are already pretty good now. Okay, good. Um, so the perf test uh, is available on GitHub. It's a very simple test. You can download it, run it yourself if you want. Then this is the link for JGroups. This is my baby, as I said. InfiniSpan is here. There's information about more cluster here, and then information about the EAP6 uh, product at this um, link. Uh, 
This is basically it, just on time. Um, do you have any questions? Okay, I'll be here all day long. Um, thank you. <laughs>